pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Come on, can you make some noise in the room? You made it to church. You look good. You look awesome. Uh, can you turn to your neighbor and tell him, you look so good today. If you're married, you better say that with a lot of enthusiasm and you better mean it. You look so good today. Uh, I believe there's no better place that you could be on a Sunday morning than here at Somos Church. And I'm so glad to see you. You guys look incredible. Uh, if you're new here, uh, we, we welcome you. We hope you feel at home. Every single month, uh, we uh, start a new series, a new collection of talks. Uh, and this month, we have been on Cancel Fear. Can someone say that with me? Cancel Fear. Cancel Fear. Uh, I believe it's been so good as we kind of like dive into this concept of fear. What fears are healthy for us? There is a healthy fear. What fears are unhealthy? Uh, and for me personally, this month, is ha it has been so much growth as, as we've been talking about this. And, and even, uh, it's not only on Sundays, but continuing the conversation on Thursdays. Uh, it's just been really like, crazy as I've been like diving into it and realize, man, I have so much stuff inside. Uh, so if you miss one of the weeks or a couple of the weeks, you can always go to YouTube, uh, Somos uh, Church, or uh, on Podcast Now. Come on, somebody. Uh, so yeah, you can look for us, Somos Church, and you can follow up. I really believe this series has been so good and so healthy as we internally look at some of the things that uh, we struggle with. And today we're continuing the conversation, a conversation we started last week about one of the most common fears that we all face, uh, some of the most common fears that we face, and that is the fear of abandonment and the fear of rejection. Super fun topic to talk about on a Sunday morning, you know? <laughs> like, hey, last week it was like deep surgery. I don't know for me, uh, for you, for me it was, you know? Like, welcome to church. Let's deal with our abandonment and rejection issues, you know. Uh, but it's good, you know. It's good because we tend, to, what we tend to do in life is just kind of, we have those things and we never uh, really internalize, heal them. We just kind of keep on going with huge baggage. So uh, hopefully as we dive in a little bit further, God's going to do some cool things in our personal lives, in our hearts, and our souls. Uh, and next week, we're going to finish the series. And I already have the message for next week. And I'm so excited. That is like really exciting for me. It's going to be so good as we close our Cancel Fear series. So are you guys ready this morning to dive deep uh, into this. Um, have you ever had, have you ever had a moment that, that you just feel, uh, I'm going to be rejected, you know? Like, you just, you, you're about to approach something, a meeting, an interview, uh, at work, with your spouse, you know, you know ahead of time, man, I'm going to go with my wife, I'm going to ask her something, she's going to say, you know, you know ahead of time, you know, and you kind of prepare yourself, and and, 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 and then you're pleasantly surprised, you know, and it's the complete opposite. Or maybe, in fact, it is, and it hurts, but it doesn't hurt as bad. Uh, I, I remember when Beatrice and I, we first started dating, or our first friend date, okay? Our first friend date, which I encourage you if you're single, have friend dates. Don't just go dating and go in love and then... A year later, you figure out you're not meant for each other. You already crossed so much boundaries, and you are so hurt, you know? Uh, that's a, another topic. <laughs> but uh, on our first uh, friend date, and I shared this before, you know, but I just think it's so hilarious, you know? We, we knew each other for many years. We were friends for many, many years. And, and, but we never saw each other as anything else other than friends, which that's good too. Side note, oh man, I just feel it, you know. <laughs> if you're single, not everyone is a possibility, you know. <laughs> like you see everyone like, maybe I'm going to marry them, maybe I'm going to, and it's like, no, you ruined the friendship, you know. Uh, so we were friends for many years, and it was so much uh, fun. We would catch up. We would talk about God, and it was just an awesome friendship that we had. We would catch up, not every day at night. I'm just helping you out here, okay? <laughs> Once a month, we would catch up, and we would talk, and, and it was just a, a really cool friendship for many years. 
And then finally, uh, we were in the same city uh, for the very first time after many years. And that summer, it was like, uh, man, she's here. She's a really good friend. And it's the first summer, you know, that we're in the same city. And I was like, man, I, I need to ask her out, right? Like, I mean, we're friends. At, at that point, I was more ready for marriage, you know, and in life. So I was like, I mean, let's see what this girl is all about, right? And, and I was like, hey, you're going to be in the city. She's like, yeah, I'm going to be in town. Hey, we should grab some coffee sometime. And I was just so nervous to even say that. Like, I was freaking out because, like, man, she's going to be like, nope, you know? Uh, you're putting yourself out there. I was freaking out. And, yeah, we should uh, grab some coffee sometime. And I would, like, just turn off my phone and not look back, you know? I was so insecure, so fearful about being rejected that I was, like, tiptoeing around it for, like, a good two weeks. Every other day, I was like, hey, would you grab some coffee sometime? But just so full of fear of rejection, and it dictated a whole lot in how I was, like, asking her out for coffee, you know? Until finally, after two weeks or so, my incredible wife, woman, bold and courageous, said, hey, are you going to put a date, like, when and where, and let's do it, you know? Like, what do you mean we should sometime? Like, just tell me when and where, and we're going to do it. But it's crazy how the fear of rejection, it, it, it defines a whole lot of how you do things. It, 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 it's so crazy how we carry so many hurts, wounds, betrayal, fear of abandonment, rejection. We carry so many hurts, and we don't even realize how much it dictates how we do life, how we feel when our kids say, no, I'm going to my room. It crushes our spirit because we're dealing with so many of these things. It's crazy how when it gets tough at work, we go into crazy, extreme, worst-case scenarios. I'm going to get fired. And it's like, no, they're just telling you to show up on time. You know, like, hey, show up on time. And you go into, I hate this job. They don't know who I am. Like, why are they telling me? I'm doing all of this. And it's like, they're just saying show up on time. You know, but we bring so much of our fears, of our struggles, of our hurt into everyday living. It, it, it maybe has stopped you from reaching out to someone new. You know, you see someone and you know how, like, you can always tell, like, man, I can really click with that person. You know, we can really be friends just by the look of it, you know. And, and, and because of these fears and it's awkward to meet people, it's awkward, awkward to make new friendships, especially when it comes to church. We all want community. That's why you're here. But then the service finishes and you run out, you know. And it's like, I got my community. No, you got a message. You got to worship. You got God. That is good. But that, that's not the whole picture. The whole picture is community. Community, right? But maybe these fears, these things that we struggle, the betrayals, the hurts, the wounds, we carry them and we allow them to dictate how we do life. We allow them to put something on us that stop us to just say, hey, how are you? My name is so-and-so. What's up with your life? And it's funny, right, because when you were super young, I'm not calling you old, uh, but when you were in elementary, right, everyone was your best friend, <laughs> you know, like, hi, how are you? My name's Sergio. We're best friends forever and ever, you know, like if they sat down next to you, you're BFFs forever and ever, you know, and as we grow older, we carry more hurt and wounds and they dictate how much of how we do life, you know, maybe at work, it's stopping you to give it your all. Maybe it's stopping you to just say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to give in my 150% at work. I'm going to just go in and be the best at whatever it is that you do, because there are some hurts, wounds, things that we carry, and they stop us a little bit. Maybe it is with your spouse or your relationships that we build some walls because of so much hurt and so many things that we have gone through. And it doesn't allow you to just be your complete self, be the person who God created you to be. My whole point here is like in small ways or in big ways, these fears, wounds, hurts, 
we allow them to dictate how we do life. We allow certain circumstances that are happening around us that are hard, that they trigger certain things. We allow them to dictate how we walk on our everyday life. So my prayer today is that if we talk about uh, specifically a story of a man that we would be encouraged, that we would see uh, this story as an example, that we would see this story as something that can challenge us into growing and not allowing our circum circumstances to dictate who we are. That's our prayer today. Uh, so, so the title of my message as we dive into this, just give it your all. Come on, tell your neighbor, just give it, just give it your all. Just give it your all. The story we're going to be going through today is of a man called Joseph. Someone say Joseph. Joseph. Joseph was a young dude. Uh, he had 11 siblings. And the thing about Joseph is that he was the favorite. Someone here the favorite. You're like, you're confident about it in the family. You know you're, you're the fave. Come on. Just two of us? They're like, <laughs> okay, okay. Anyone else? Come on, don't be shy. That's something to be proud of. Like, I'm the favorite. Like, I won that position because of my awesomeness, okay? Uh, <laughs> the thing about Joseph is that he was the favorite. He was the favorite because uh, he was one of the younger siblings. And, and the father wasn't shy about it. The, the father didn't shy away from Joseph being the favorite. He would tell the siblings, I love this dude. He is the best one. Like, I kind of like you all, but he's the one. <laughs> you know, like, I love him. He, 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 and, and, and he just knew it. Joseph just knew it. And he would play into this thing. In fact, he would talk bad about the siblings. Hey, so-and-so was doing this other thing. And he was a spoiled one. That's what I'm trying to say, you know. He was a spoiled one. He knew it. The way he would talk about it, what he would say, how he would say it, the way he carried himself, uh, he, he was the favorite. And, and the dad, again, he just did a horrible job in parenting because we all have a favorite. I hope I don't, right? My kids are young, but... But, but you have to kind of, like, be sensitive to the other kids, you know. We have three kids, you know, and as they grow, I, I hope that I'm good at managing the favoritism. And, and I'm just like, you know, you're all my favorite. But internally, I'm going to keep that just close to my heart. No one's ever going to know if I have a favorite. Uh, <laughs> but but, but uh, Jacob, the dad, he did a horrible job. He just made a difference. Like, he made it obvious. In fact, one day, he gave... Uh, his son Joseph a sick jacket like he gave him a special a special robe uh, and, 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 and it's crazy right because if nowadays that would mean something really special right if someone gave you a Gucci jacket right you would be like what's up colorful one you would feel really special back in the day it was it, it meant even a whole lot more it, it meant like a stamp of approval. It meant like you are it. Back in those days, it was even more significant. And the dad didn't care. He was like, you know what? I'm going to give you some Gucci. I'm going to dress you up. Like, you are my favorite one. You are the one that I love the most. So because of that, guess what happened? The same thing happens with your siblings. Uh, if you're the favorite one or if you're the sibling that has other ones that are the favorite, this happens. Now you don't like that sibling. You know what I'm saying? Now you just kind of low-key hate him, you know, like you're jealous of him, like you got some Gucci, I don't, like what's up with that, you know? You got some favor, like, you know, like that, that happens. So he had 11 siblings, and the 11 siblings, like, they, they felt this rejection. They felt this abandonment. They felt that the dad favored this one kid, and he was the younger one, you know? I feel that's even harder, you know? The oldest, we're the favorite because we're the oldest, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, but, but it even was really, really hard for the brothers. And then to add on top of that, this kid, Joseph, would kind of rub it in their face. Like, why wear the robe all the time? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're the favorite one. You're the favorite one. He didn't only stop there, but he was talking bad about other people, like all his, uh, his other siblings. You know, like, you're already the favorite. Like, why are you crushing 
your siblings? Why are you talking bad about them? You already have the recognition. You already are the favorite. But he didn't care because he felt so loved. He felt so favored. He felt so embraced. He felt that he knew who he was because the dad affirmed him. The dad affirmed him. And it's interesting, right, this, this whole story. I encourage you to see it. We're going we're gonna to jump on some, uh, some, some, some places in the Bible of this story. But, but if you have a chance to just read through it, it's a really cool story. Genesis 37. But there's a moment, right, as, as they're growing up that, that, you know, Joseph is favored. And one day, uh, the, the dad says, hey, go and look for your brothers that are working. And it kind of is crazy because the brothers are working, you know, and Joseph is like chilling with the dad. And the dad's like, go check on them, you know, like see how they're doing. Uh, and they go, and we're going to read this story in Genesis 37, verse 18. And it says, uh, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, this is Joseph walking to them at work to see what they were up to. Uh, the brothers say, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance as he approached. They made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns like a hole. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we will see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of this scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness, like if that was better. <laughs> then he'll die without our... without." us laying our hand on him, Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Come on, they took the Gucci out. Verse 24, then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming towards them. It was a group of Ishmaelites trader taking a load of gum balm and aromatic resin from Gilgit down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? We have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelites traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, who were Midianites traders, came by, Joseph's brother pulled him out of the cistern and sold him, sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. This is a crazy story, right? That, that Joseph, the brother, favorite brother, uh, he's just there going about his day. And the siblings had so much hate. They had so much anger. They had so much resentment. They felt so rejected and abandoned by the dad. They were struggling with some things to the point of saying, let's kill our brother. To the point of saying, and not only saying, but actually physically grabbing their sibling, ripping off a robe, leaving him naked and throwing him in a cistern and a hole in the, in, the, in, the, in the floor that was meant to carry water. They just threw them there without clothes, naked. And, and their plan was, we'll just let him die there. And we can read through this, right? And, and we kind of, but just try to think about the hurt of Joseph. The screams, the cry, like, what are you doing? Like, the, the anguish that he was feeling. The siblings grabbing him, own blood, grabbing him and throwing him into just let's let him die. And then for them, grace and love was Let's not allow him to die. Let's sell him as a slave. What gracious of them. <laughs> like, we're not going to let him die. Let's just, let's just give him out as a slave. Imagine the pain of Joseph going from being the favorite 
to now being a slave. It's crazy to think what hurt people are able to do. It's crazy to think that these siblings were so hurt to the point of doing something of this magnitude. It's wild to think that when you're hurt, you hurt people, knowingly or unknowingly. It's crazy to think what feeling abandoned makes you do, what feeling rejected makes you do, what feeling jealous will make you do. And, and I don't want to go here and just talk about this crazy story and drama and like sip our tea and like, oh, you know what Joseph and the brothers did, you know, like and get all gossipy here, you know. What I want to ask you today and flip the question is, what have you done with your own hurts? Welcome to church. <laughs> what have you done with your own personal hurts and wounds and the feeling of betrayal, rejection, abandonment? What have you done with the jealousy? What have you personally done to other people, knowingly or not knowing, consciously or subconscious? What have you done? If we were reading your story, what would it say? Hopefully it doesn't say, you know, I want to throw some, some of my brothers to a hole or kill them. But maybe yes. <laughs> we don't know. What would we read here if this was your story? What, what would the plan be for you with your own circumstances and the things that you have faced and experienced? How much of your hurts have dictated a lot of who you are today? And this is not a conversation to judge you or to make you feel judged. This is a conversation to bring it out, face it, and learn how to deal with it in a healthy way. Allow God to come and heal those deep wounds that we feel. And maybe it's not as horrible as this, but maybe you talking to your boss about how everyone else is horrible it might be really bad as well. Maybe you trying to gain favor with your boss and, and speaking about others to him is the consequence of this deep fear of rejection and acceptance and hurt. In your context, in your life, what is it? We think it's not as bad if we throw someone in the hole, but what about giving someone the cold shoulder? Someone that wants to be a part of your life. Someone that wants to care for you. Someone that wants to be a part of your circle and you're just like, uh. We can judge all day here, but what about those things that we do? What about not being intentional and being welcoming and loving and encouraging to one another, to our spouse, to our kids, to our friends. Isn't that also bad when we allow our circumstances to dictate what we do? What have you done out of rejection? What have you done out of hurt? What have you done out of a deep fear of abandonment. Maybe you don't fully recognize it, or maybe you do, and today is the perfect opportunity for us to dig deep and see what are the things, what are the things that are moving me, shaping me, that I need to put a stop to that and allow God to reframe what I do and how I do things. What are you doing today in the middle of the hard circumstances that you're facing that those hard circumstances that you're facing, they trigger things. They trigger those things that you've been carrying. What are you doing today in the middle of those circumstances that you're facing? 
Are you, are you seeing that you are a little bit more short-tempered lately? Are, are, are you angry? Are you anxious all the time or out of nowhere just anxiety cripples in? Um, are, are, do you just recognize you have a, a new lack of just patience and are you being closed off? Are, are you being kind of mean or, or, or are you being insecure? Are you just feeling like everyone wrongs you all the time? What is it in your circumstance, in your life that costs it in things to come out? And again, I'm not judging here, but, but it's important for us to say, I have a wound I need to heal. If you break a leg, if you get a deep hurt, you run to the hospital, I hope. But what we do in life is we carry some deep hurt and wounds. And, 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 and as we get older, we feel them a little bit more. As we grow older, we kind of recognize them a little bit more, but it's hard to let them go because they have shaped so much of who we are. Because the hurt is real. Your circumstance is real. The stress is real. The things that you face, they're real. The tensions, the frustrations that you're facing today, they are real. The problems that no one knows, the things that you're facing that no one knows, they are real and they are real to you. But as real as these circumstances are, they don't need to define you any longer. That's the good news, that those things don't need to dictate who you are. These circumstances don't need to dictate the God-given character and identity and purpose that he has uniquely given to you. You are uniquely made by God. And God designed you with a beautiful purpose in mind. With a beautiful identity and personality and character in mind. And we are all meant to be different. But we allow so many of our circumstances to dictate and shape who we become. And I just want to encourage you today that they don't need to define you any longer. The anger doesn't need to define you any longer. The lack of patience doesn't need to define you any longer. The anxiety doesn't need to define you any longer. The shyness, the intimidation, the insecurity, the fear, like they don't need to define you any longer. doesn't matter what comes your way. God made you. God created you. God is with you. No matter what storm or circumstance you are facing, he is right there alongside with you. These storms and struggles, they don't need to define you any longer. Come on, can you believe that this morning that the things that you're facing doesn't need to define you any longer? Come on, God wants to redefine a whole lot in how we deal with these circumstances. You know, it's crazy that Joseph, despite being ripped not only from this beautiful gift that, that his father gave him, this beautiful robe, but he wasn't only stripped off of a beautiful gift, he was stripped off of his life. His family sold him into slavery by his own family. And he didn't allow himself to be defined by this moment. This moment that we can all see how it can really alternate the whole course of your life. This moment of deep pain and anguish and rejection could have defined this young man forever. Some of the stuff that we have gone through has defined us, but Joseph said, I'm not going to allow this moment, this situation to define me. In Genesis 39 says, Joseph was taken, was taken to Egypt. He was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was the captain of the, garden for, of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was, was with Joseph. Doesn't matter where you go. Doesn't matter what you face. God is with you. So because the Lord was with Joseph, he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of this Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed 
this. He noticed that this young man had something on his life. That something was God. That something was favor. That something was that, that this young man, despite being a slave, Potiphar didn't know the backstory, maybe, but despite being a slave, why is this young kid like working hard, being a like you're a slave, you do the bare minimum, you do what they're asking, and what this tells me is that Potiphar noticed something different in Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. Verse 4, this pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household's affair ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished, so Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Like, he is a slave just sold into slavery by his own family that was trying to kill him. And Joseph goes and kills it as a slave and gets promoted to the right. Like, what am I missing here? Like, dude, you are literally on your bed for months and years and you don't get up at that depression. Like, we see this, and I just have to say, if that happened to me, I would never give up, get, get up, man. I don't know if I could get up. I don't know if I could get past that pain. Come on, some of us, we give up for way less. And not to minimize what you're going through, but we give up way too easy. Instead of looking at the hurt, the pain, why I want to grow from this, God, what can you teach me from this? Joseph knew something. Joseph, in this situation, he knew something. He knew he was favored by God. He knew that he wasn't only favored by his father, but that he was favored by God. And that favor wasn't circumstantial. That favor wasn't only when he had the Gucci. That favor was when he had the Gucci, when he didn't have the Gucci, when he was the slave. This favor was on him. God was on him. So him knowing that God was with him made him just say, you know what? This is not going to define me. This pain, this moment is not going to define me. I'm going to turn this moment into momentum and I'm going to give it my all. I'm just going to give it my all. I'm going to give it my all if I am with my dad. I'm going to give it my all if I'm as a slave. I am going to give my all. God's favor is not a magic thing. It's not a thing that's like, oh, God, God's favor and every door opens before me. God's favor is connected to those who are faithful. God's favor in your life is not a magic thing that comes from the sky and separates you from anyone else. God's favor is because of faithfulness and obedience. God is just on the lookout who is faithful, who is obedient. What's in your life? If you want God's favor, and trust me, you want God's favor because every door will open no matter what circumstance you're facing. But that faithfulness is, con that favor is connected to faithfulness. Being full of faith. Come on, someone say th this with me. Full of faith. Full of faith. Not full of faith to say, I can't wait when I get out of Potiphar's house. Not faith of saying, whenever I have my business, whenever I reach that. Come on, we make faith so materialistic all the time. I have faith for that car and that house and that thing. And I have faith for that spouse that's looking fine over there and their Instagram is looking fine. Oh, they posted a scripture. They must be really Christian. You know, like we put, we put faithfulness into that moment right there. 
But being faithful is saying right now in this moment, I am going to be so full of faith. I'm going to be so full of faith as a slave and everything that they ask me to do, I'm going to do it unto the Lord. I'm going to do it with excellence. I'm going to do like if God is with me and he is for me and he is not against me. I'm going to go to work and I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to show up 10 minutes before I need to show up. I'm going to sweep, mop, clean the restrooms, whatever. I have to do not to impress anyone, but because I am doing this unto the Lord. I have faith for right now. I am full of faith that right now, this moment, this situation, this circumstance, God placed me here. And if God placed me here, God has something for me here. Come on, somebody. I hope that you can get so full of faith in the middle of your circumstance. We want to get rid of our own circumstance, own moment. And God is like, no, I have something for you right now. Come on, can you be full of faith for right now? Can you be full of faith in your marriage? Can you be so full of faith in your friendships? Can you be so full of faith at work? Please be full of faith at work. Not whenever you switch jobs, you're going to bring yourself to that next job. You're going to bring yourself to that next career opportunity. Come on, God has something for you right now. Can you be so full of faith that no matter what you're facing, it doesn't dictate your circumstance. It doesn't dictate your character. That it doesn't dictate your character, who you are. We allow our circumstances to change us. You are awesome. You are great. You are incredible. You are favor you're intelligent you're a hard worker you are smart don't allow that because you have a job you don't like change you don't allow who you are to change just because you don't like school don't allow who you are to be changed because there's some problems in your marriage don't allow who you are to change Just because of the circumstances that you are facing, he wasn't waiting for the next. He said, I am going to do everything with excellence. Everything with excellence. If you are waiting for your next season to give it your all, if you are waiting for your next season to give it your all, your next season might never show up. It might never show up if you're just waiting for the next to give it your all. Come on, give it your all today. Potential will not promote you. Potential will not open doors. Your God-given character, faithfulness, and favor shown through your success opens up Influence opens up doors, opens up your next opportunities. God sees your potential, but he sees you. And the doors that he opens up for you is in how you're dealing with things today. Come on, give it your all today. Don't wait until the next season to give it your all Joseph's story shows us it is possible. It is possible. It it, it is possible to be in the middle of a painful circumstance and thrive to the point of being in charge of everything in this house. The interesting thing about favor is that favor makes you recognizable and people start to notice uh, Joseph and and Potiphar's wife started noticing Joseph. He's like, hmm. What's up with that man? <laughs> he he kind of got a lot of favor r- immediately. Be careful what the favor of God would do in your life. Because it would attract good things. But it also attracts some negative things. Yeah. It attracts some new kind of temptation. And I love Joseph, right? Because Potiphar's wife was there on a daily basis, the Bible says. Hey, I want to sleep with you. Hey, I want to sleep with you. Hey, I want to sleep with you. And Joseph was like, girl, get out of here. (laughs) Don't you see everything God has given me? How am I going to sin unto God and unto Potiphar? 
And he was there, she was there like, come on, come on, come on, until one day this lady gets thirsty and crazy, and she literally grabs Joseph and rips off his new Gucci, or maybe it wasn't Gucci right now, you know, maybe it's another kind of robe or something, but she literally grabs his robe as Joseph is running away from her. And he runs away. And she's right there. And poor Joseph is again naked, vulnerable, running away from temptation. Running away for just doing the right thing. This lady goes crazy. And the interesting thing is I have to wonder, maybe this lady also was so full of feeling neglected. Why was she so pushy with this guy, you know? Like, you have your husband, but maybe she felt neglected, rejected, abandoned by her own husband that caused her to do all of this. Again, it's crazy what our hurts will make us do. We do some crazy, crazy things, crazy things when we are hurt. This lady accuses that he was, that Joseph was trying to get with her, and she makes up this whole story. And Joseph ends up in prison again. So, so, so now, he goes from being the favorite to being a slave to being in prison. All because of who he is. And he was a great guy. And I love that God's favor in our lives, we think it's, God's favor in my life is always going to elevate me. In this case, in this story, God's favor is like, do I really want God's favor? Because he went from being the favorite to being a slave, now a slave in prison. A slave in prison. The interesting thing about God is that God has some plans that we don't know about. God has some things in store for you that you don't know. That job that you hate, that crushes your soul and your spirit every day, that marriage, your kids, whatever it is that you're facing, God has a purpose behind the scenes that you don't know, that you don't even think about how God can turn things around. You don't even know how God can flip the script in a second. If we don't allow our circumstances to dictate our character, Joseph is in prison, and you would think he would be depressed. You would think he would be just with so much pain hurt. They did him wrong. Once again, he did the same thing. He did the same thing. He immediately, it's like, God is with me. God's faithful faithful love is with me. I'm going to be faithful in prison. And he starts working hard in prison. He starts being a great administrator in prison. What do you administrate? How many crackers you're going to eat? I don't know. But he was like, this circumstance is not going to define me. This is not going to define me. And he goes after it. And in fact, he literally was promoted again to supervisor in the prison. They made a position that probably didn't even exist for him. They saw there's something different. Why is this guy shining if you are a slave in prison? Why are you thriving in life if you are in prison? Come on, what is your prison today? What is your emotional prison today that you can't get out, that you feel trapped, that your past keeps coming back and back, that the guilt, that the shame, the would of us keep coming back, the worries, the fears, the anxiety, the fear of failure, the fear of not being enough, of not providing. Come on, what is your prison today and how do you deal with it? Can I encourage you to not allow your prison to dictate who you are today. Don't allow it to define you today. In this painful season that you might be in, in this painful circumstance that you might be in, can you just give it your all? Give it your all. Give it your all and you will see what God will do in your life. 
We can focus on the betrayal. We can focus on the hurt, pain, all of that. What I see here is not only that. What I see here is that he was in charge of everything in Potiphar's house, that he was in charge of everything in prison. He was in charge of everything. Later on, the story with Pharaoh of whole Egypt, he was the right-hand man of Pharaoh. Come on, God has something for you in whatever it is that you are facing today. Could it be that your pain has a bigger purpose that you haven't seen yet? Could it be that the way you handle your current prison could determine what God dream will come alive out of this season? Come on, God has something for you. Can we all stand as we close? I'm going to ask uh, Corey to come and, and as we close. I'm going to want to give you three quick points, three quick points. Because my prayer is that we could go out of here today and give it our all in every single area of our life. Give it our all in every single area of our lives. Three quick points as we close. Number one, first God. In the season, in the circumstance, in the pain, in the thing that you're facing today, you need to put God first. How do you give it your all? You put God first. Allow him to redefine you, to show you. Allow him to literally surprise you. Read, press in the Bible. Don't allow the Bible, to po- the, the circumstance that you're facing, to push you back from what God has for you. Come on, God has something for you today. Can you press in and put God first every day of your life? Number two that I see in Joseph, he was faithful. He gave it his all. He gave it his all. He was full of faith in the current circumstance that he was in. He wasn't waiting for next. So I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give it my all. Can you give it your all? Can you be faithful in this season, in this circumstance, in the thing that you're facing today. Number three is his character. His character. And this is the not so fun part for us. Because having character is having a good work ethic. Having character is showing up on time. Having character is being men and women of our word. That if we say that we're going to do something, we're going to do it. Having a godly character means that we are aware of our reputation. It means that we are aware. We have an awareness of who we are, how we treat people, how we do life. Having character is just being committed to being an example. A godly example. I believe that as we do these things in our personal lives, in our current prison, in our current circumstance, if we just give God our all, if we put God first and we're faithful and we work on having godly character, being disciplined, maybe the circumstance, the prison might change, maybe. It did for Joseph, not right away, but through the years. But I bet it's better to be a right-hand man at Potiphar's house in prison than just being in his prison cell, just crying every day, just allowing the pain to dictate who he is. Maybe your prison will change, your circumstance will change, but definitely if your character changes, your perspective of what you're going through definitely changes. Come on, can we pray as we close today? God, today we just put you first in our lives, God. Today we just pray that in the middle of all the hurts, fears, the middle of everything that we have faced, in the middle of all the pain that we have gone through, that maybe that pain today we We have recognized that we've hurt other people, God, that we have rejected other people, abandoned. Those things have defined us, God. And today, we just surrender to you. Today, we surrender it all to you, God. 
Today we give you our pain, our hurts. We don't want them to define us any longer. Today we just say that we give it to you, God. We give you our pain, our hurt, God. And we just pray that you would turn things around. Come on, if you're going through some heavy pain right now, if you're going through maybe sickness or you're going through some struggles at home in your business, if you're going through some hardships, some prison, emotional prison, some things that feel unbearable, no one's looking, can you raise both of your hands up? Just need God in your life to come and do some divine intervention. Come on, whatever you're going through today, God is with you. He is for you. He has never left you or abandoned you. He has beautiful plans for you. I pray today, God, that you would come and intervene in every situation, giving you boldness, giving you encouragement, giving you faith, God. Give something new, God, in every single person, God, that needs to make a shift in their life. We pray today that our circumstances will not define us any longer. We believe that as we give you our alls today, you turn things around. You turn things around, God. Come on, you have to give some things to God this morning. We're going to sing this chorus just for a couple of minutes. Just encourage you, give God this divine change. God, I give you my all. I give you my heart. If you want it, God, you have it. You have my all. You have my heart, my hopes, my dreams, my purpose, my character. You have everything, God. This morning, you have everything. In faith, in faith, we give you our heart. In faith, we give you our hurts. In faith, we just give it to you, Lord. We give it to you, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. This morning, we just trust that everything we have is better in your hands. Come on, that anxiety is better in his hands. That depression is better in his hands. That worry, that fear, those things are better in God's hands. And today, God, we just give them all to you. And we thank you that you make all things new. And we pray and confess and declare that right now, everything's made new as we give you our all. And we just thank you, God, that our circumstances don't define us, but that you are the one who defines us. We thank you for that this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, can you make some noise for our God that has good things? Hey, can I encourage you, give it your all, give it your all this week. Give it your all that El Paso shakes. Like, what happened? What happened in, in, in this job? Like, what happened with you, you know? Uh, can, can we have some faith this week for that in every single area? Amen? Hey, we love you all. We have a space for you to connect, coffee, talk to someone. Uh, thank you all for coming. We'll see you in connect groups or on Sunday. Love you all.